Amen. God bless you. Thank you for uh, streaming live with us here at our Bible study hour of power here uh, at the Mount Carmel Church. I am um, Pastor Theron Williams and uh, we are streaming live uh, from the beautiful Mount Carmel Church here and uh, here in Indianapolis, Indiana, 9610 East 42nd Street, Indianapolis, Indiana. And um, we are extremely excited to have you to join us uh, as we uh, engage the Word of God. We are fasting for the month, uh, for the uh, Lenten season. And during the course of our fast, we are also praying because fasting and prayer go together. And on Tuesdays, we are fasting, some of us, from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m., and others of us who can, we are fasting for a full 24 hours, 8 a.m. On, um, on Tuesday to 8 a.m. on Wednesday. And we are praying incrementally. We are praying at 9, at 12, 3, <clears throat> 6, and if you're up at 9, we're praying at 9 as well. And so it's 12 o'clock and we're going to enter into prayer. Father, we come to say thank you for all that you do and for who you are and how you have blessed us. God, we are grateful to you for your love, for your grace and for all that you've done. Thank you, God, for the Mount Carmel Church. We pray, God, that you would continue to bless us, that you might use us as an instrument of redemption and salvation here in the Far East Side community. God, we're praying for our community here, the Far East Side, where you have placed us, and you placed us here to make a difference. God, we pray that you would intervene in the life of this community, that you would use us to be your instrument for intervention. God, we pray that you would shower us with your blessings and with your power with your endurance so that we can keep on doing what you have called us to do. God, we pray for those who are sick and shut in among us, for those who are struggling with financial issues, family issues, issues with their health, issues with their employment. God, whatever we need, we know that you can be that. And for those who have lost loved ones, come alongside those, God, and be whatever it is that they've lost. We thank you for these moments. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. All right. Um, we've been studying um, the, the Ten Commandments and Reverend Lola Bartlett and Reverend Patricia Holman uh, made me start using um, technology um, to present my Bible study. And uh, they challenged me and, you know, they said, well, this is what uh, the Bible study group likes. They, they like uh, PowerPoint presentations. And so I'm doing a PowerPoint presentation because the sisters pushed me. And that's what sisters do. They will push you. Uh, they will challenge you to go to the next level. And that's probably why, one of the reasons why so many of us don't want women to be a part of leadership because they push us to places we didn't intend to go. And so um, I've been pushed. And so I have a PowerPoint presentation and I have slides that I have um, that I have handed out uh, for your consideration. And we've been looking at uh, are we up and running? Yeah. Okay. Is loading or something? Is it up? Okay, yes. Okay, it's taking a little longer. Okay. 
okay. Yes. We've been looking at the Ten Commandments, and um, today we land on the Fifth Commandment. That's Exodus chapter 20, verse 12, where it says, Honor your father and mother, so that you may live long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. Honor your father and your mother, so that you may live long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. Now, traditionally, when we understand this passage, we do so from a Western ideology. Our understanding of family is mother, father, children in the nuclear family. Um, and that's how we understand this, this fifth commandment as if God is addressing individuals in this passage. And so when we hear this passage, we automatically reflect back to our own households, so to speak. And that's one of the issues with trying to understand the Bible from a Western mentality, from a Western hermeneutic, so to speak, or Western interpretation. It always individualizes the text. And when you individualize the text, you leave a large segment of the population outside of the boundaries of that particular text. For example, when Moses brought these people out of uh, Egypt, the Bible said there were two million people that had come out. This is assuming that everybody out of two million people, that everybody had a mother and a father. That's absurd. There were people who were part of this community that didn't have parents. The parents were dead. They were being raised by their uncles or their aunts or their older siblings or their grandparents. There are people in this congregation who did not have a mother and a father. So to individualize this text, to just talk about the nuclear family, is to exclude those who did not have a mother or a father. Obviously, they had a mother or father, otherwise they wouldn't be here. But in a real sense, we apply this text to our context to say that I have a mother and a father in my home that's raising me, or I had a mother raising me, or a father raising me. I had parents raising me. But there are some people in this community that we live in right now here in Indianapolis, as well as the community of the ancient Israelites who did not have both parents, who did not have a mother or a father, or who did not have any. They, there were orphans in this community. So to boil it down to just my household is to exclude people who are orphans who don't have mothers and fathers. So we have to learn to relook at this because we look at scriptural passages so individualistically that we rob that passage of the power and the intent that it has to transform entire communities. Um, so he says, honor your father and your mother. So now, if we're looking at it, from an individualistic perspective, honor your mother, your father, and your mother, that implies, okay, there it is, yes. Because the word honor is actually a culturally constructed evaluation of a person's actions, which determines a person's worth as in their price or value to the community. That is, if you don't deserve honor, then you don't get honor. The text says, honor your father and your mother. Well, if your father and your mother 
are not honorable, why is it that the children are required to pay homage, honor, and deference to individuals who don't deserve to be honored? The truth is there are some parents who have abuse their children physically, psychologically, financially. And now we are forcing children to honor and to have deference and respect, almost reverence to a person that abused physically, abused you psychologically, abused you financially, and abused you spiritually. And now we are forcing a child or an individual to honor that? When we do that, we are creating monsters because we are demanding that an individual honors someone who have been abusive and exploitive to them. All you have to do is open your newspaper, turn on the news, and we see parents misusing and abusing their own children. We see it all the time. And one of the things that always comes to mind when I see this is that some people just don't deserve children. If this is how you treat children, if this is how you abuse children, if this is how you exploit children, then you don't need children. Um, there have been parents who have sold their own children into prostitution. There have been parents who have abused and molested their own children, beat their children to a pulp. And now that child breaks free and comes to church and somebody in Sunday school or somebody in the pulpit is preaching to them, now you got to honor your mother and your father. How do you think that makes that person feel? When you guilt them into honoring someone who has historically been abusive to them. That creates all type of psychological dysfunctions. Now I've got to wrestle with God telling me to honor someone who has dishonored me their entire life. Now I gotta honor that person. So I don't think that that's what this passage is talking about. Now, let's, let's understand Israel, it was a community just like every other community. They had good people and they had bad people in it. They had people who were wonderful and they had people who were just scoundrel. Just like our community, just like any community, you got good people and bad people in it. So let's not mythologize the Israelite community thinking all of them were little angels because they weren't. There were some horrible people who were a part of this community. So when we look at this passage, what this passage is trying to teach us, when it says, honor your father and your mother so that you may live long in the land the Lord your God is giving you, the implication is Honor the tradition of your foreparents so that you may live long in the land the Lord your God has given you. That's the implication. It is honoring the tradition of our foreparents so that I don't have to have immediate parents in my life in order for me to honor the tradition of my foreparents. Even though I may not have a mother or a father, I am a part of this community and this community has forebears. And those forebears has left a tradition 
for the generation that succeed to follow. That's the focus of this text because we're talking about the practical application or the practical implication of the Ten Commandments. That these commandments were imposed upon the Israelite community to help a community to remain a community, to help it remain strong and solid and vibrant and to protect it from potential collapse. And one of the ways a community collapses is when the young people disregard the tradition that their forepairs established. We see it now. You see it now every day. The traditions that our foreparents established, our forebears instituted, we need to be following that tradition. As Israelites, they followed that tradition. They have a rich tradition. They had just come out of 430 years of bondage. And instead of collapsing under the weight of oppression, slavery, and domination, these Israelites multiplied and grew. Anybody who was under that type of pressure, anybody who was under that type of system for so long should have shriveled away and just dissipated. You don't multiply when you're living under these types of conditions. You shrink. And in time, you extinguish. But these Israelites living under what they had lived under one generation after the next for 430 years, after 430 years, they had blossomed. There were two million of them, at least. At least two million. So that suggests that they are a strong, resilient people, which is a tradition that they would have passed down from one generation to the next. That is, you can't crush me. I don't care what you do to me. I don't care how much pressure you apply to me. I don't care how much you oppress me and dominate me. God is with us as a people and you can't get rid of us, even if you try. That's the Israelite people, a resilient, solid, wonderful people. And that's part of a tradition that they are passing down from one generation to the next. We have a God that sustained us through 430 years of oppression. We got a God that kept us and sustained us. Further, when they are given this commandment to honor your father and your mother, that is to honor the tradition of your forebears, that in this text, they are establishing and building on the tradition that they already have. They're getting ready to get the law. They're getting ready to get uh, these decrees that we read in the book of Deuteronomy. They're getting ready to get all of this. And they will have to pass this down from one generation to the next, even to this day. So the emphasis is, it's honoring the traditions of our forebears. How does that speak to us as an African American community? We have, we are resilient people because, you know, I, I was just talking to, um, to Deacon Moore, the Israelite community and the African American community mirror each other. Our experience is almost identical. When you read what happened to the Israelites and you look at our own history, they mirror. The Israelites were enslaved, we were enslaved. Uh, the Israelite fought for independence. We are fighting for independence. Man, I wish I had time to look at the, the, uh, the book of Exodus with us. 
because the same charges that the oppressing Egyptians made against the enslaved Israelites are the same charges that were made against black people as we were enslaved by uh, Europeans. One of the things that the, the Egyptians said to the Israelites, as the Israelites were charged to make bricks so that they can build these storehouses, these storage uh, houses so that the Pharaoh can maintain grain. You know, they, they, they had granaries that they were building with, with bricks. They were building buildings. Uh, they were doing highways. They were doing all of that for free because they were slaves. And one of the things that the Egyptians said about the Israelites who had built their society, they are lazy. When they said, we want to go and worship our gods, they said to them, the reason you want to go worship God is not because you love God, it's because you're lazy and you're trifling. So get back to work. As a matter of fact, we're not even going to give you any more straw to make your bricks. Go get your own straw and you better make the same quota that you had when we were giving you the straw because you're lazy. The same charge that they said about black folk in America, they're lazy. Man, we laid the foundation from the sweat of our forebears' backs. We laid the foundation to this place. And yet they point at you and say, you're lazy. We're lazy. You should have harvested your own fields if we're that lazy. You should have been out in the cotton fields picking if we're so lazy. You should have been harvesting your own tobacco and your own indigo and your own stuff. But you made us do it because you were too lazy to do it. And now you reverse it and call us lazy. The very same charges that were made against them were made against us. So that our, our history, our experience, you know, man, they, they parallel. You know, there, there is so much that we have in common. We parallel also that after they were emancipated and they were in that wilderness for 40 years, they crossed over into Jericho and they started taking over Canaan. Many of those Israelites, the generation died in the wilderness. Those who came out of Egypt, they died in the wilderness. They didn't get a chance to go over. The only one that got a chance to go over was Joshua. He went over into the promised land. The rest of them died. Now there's a new generation that arose in Canaan who forgot about the traditions of their forefathers. Forgot about it. And they had so many issues because they refused to hold on to the tradition of their father and their mothers. And Moses said, if you are going to maintain the land and live long in the land that the God, your father, the God of your fathers is giving you, you need to learn how to honor the tradition of your fathers and your mothers. And because they walked away from that tradition, they had all of these problems. They walked away from their tradition and started worshiping Baal and started following other gods. What happened? They lost the land. Many of them were taken up and taken into Assyria. They didn't enjoy the land because they refused to hold on to the um, uh, traditions of their fathers. They lost the land. So in the book of 1 Kings, when we talk about the deportation of 10 of the 12 tribes of Israel and they were moved into Assyria, we don't hear from those 10 tribes anymore throughout the Bible. They're gone. They are the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Now from that point on, throughout the rest of the Bible, after the book of the Kings, we are only dealing with two of the 12 tribes of Israel. We're dealing with the tribe of Judah and the tribe of 
Who? The tribe of Judah and who? Benjamin. Benjamin. The tribes of Judah and the tribe of Benjamin. The rest of the ten are gone. Uprooted and taken out of the land. Why? Because they refused to honor the traditions that their forebears had passed down to them. That's why they couldn't stay in the land. It parallels with our community. The reason we're having so many issues with people in our community, we've got all of this killing, all of this robbery, all of these issues, and it, th there are a number of factors that go into what we are experiencing in our community today, a number of factors that go into that. But one of them is, is that we have a generation that dishonors the tradition of their foreparents. Church used to be a value and a priority in our community. It did. Used to be a value. Used to be a priority. And for so many people, it's no longer a value. It's no longer a priority. I was just on my way, on my way to church. I was listening to a podcast and this guy was on talking about a certain pastor in Atlanta who was talking about selling cannabis out of his church and growing cannabis on the land of his church and all of that. And he weighed, he weighed it in to, uh, he weighed in on the, on that conversation because people across the black church had been talking about it. But when he started talking about it, he wasn't talking about the specific issue of a church growing cannabis, is that good or is it bad? He started dogging the whole black church. Said, and that's why young people don't go to church anymore because the church ain't about nothing, the church ain't about this. You tell me what has the black church done in its community, it ain't done this, it ain't done that. He just took a broad broom and just swept across the entire black church community as if nobody is doing nothing in the community in black churches. And that's just not true. But that's the mentality a lot of people, and he was a younger cat too. And that's the mentality that a lot of younger people have about the church. Why? Because they look at one mega church on television or they hear about a couple of megachurch pastors who have fallen by the wayside. And then they group all of the churches, black churches in to one bag together and say, this is uh, reflective of all of y'all. All of y'all are just like this. And that's the mentality that, that many of them have about the black church, which makes them dishonor the tradition that our foreparents have, you know, have passed on to us. You can't stay in the land. You're gonna have problems. There is a positive correlation between church attendance and mental wholeness. There is a positive correlation between people not coming to church and people who cannot handle life's issues. You know, we have always had issues in this life. We have always had challenges. We have always had pressure. But there was a time when we were able to stand under the pressure. And I believe it is because we were deeply connected to the church and we took God seriously. Now we have disregarded God. And now we think the church needs to close its doors Yet, we have a generation who can't handle anything. Collapse under any, and you ask them, what's wrong? Well, my car broke down and I'm having anxiety. What? Is that all wrong with you? Your car broke? You don't know how to catch the bus? Oh my God, no, I can't get, what? <laughs> Excuse me? I've run out of food. I don't have anything. You open their cabinets. They got all kind of stuff. You don't know what to do with that? Let Julia Williams come in here, my mother. 
she can go in there and take all of that stuff and have you a meal that you think is Thanksgiving. Because we can't handle anything. Because we have disconnected, we have a generation that has disconnected from the traditions of their forebears. They don't even want to hear it. One pastor's wife said, this is the first generation that does not take advice from his parents and, and grandparents, but they take advice from each other and they get it off the internet. And the advice that they're getting from somebody else has no experience, no more than you have. How are you getting advice from somebody who don't know as much as you do? And then you wonder why your stuff is still jacked up. You're not listening to people who have been there and done that. We got something to tell you. But so many times they feel so threatened that you might challenge how they live and when you challenge how they live, they accuse you of being judgmental. Why are you judging me? As if judging is a bad, there's a whole book in the Bible called Judges. <laughs> you judging me. Sometimes you need to be judged. Sometimes you need to be held accountable for your, for your behavior. Somebody needs to pull your coattail. Somebody needs to get in your face. And when that happens, that's a demonstration of love. Because if I don't say anything to you and allow you to do anything you want to do, that's not showing love. Because I see you headed in a direction that's going to wreck your entire life. Somebody needs to say something to you. One of my favorite basketball players, Ja Morant. Man, that boy can ball. I mean, he is Allen Iverson on steroids. And we all know how great AI was. Here is Ja Morant with a tremendous future. I don't think Ja is even 24 years old yet. And yet, he's running with bad people, bad crowds. It is alleged that when he was here in Indianapolis playing the Pacers, after the game, I think the Pacers may have beat him or something, there was a, a, um, a, a scuttle, there was, there was a confrontation on the court between the players, which happens in basketball. I grew up watching basketball. I mean, back in the day, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar knocked somebody out cold. You know, I used to see Larry Bird and, 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 and uh, uh, Isaiah Top fighting Larry Bird and Dr. J, knuckling it up, man, they fight, I mean, that's what they did. Michael Jordan going through the whole Bill Lambeer come and grab him by the head and they both, I mean, it was like WWA wrestling when you would watch basketball. It was crazy. It was insane. But then when the game was over, the game was over. It was a confrontation on the court when the Memphis Grizzlies came to Indianapolis, Indiana, and they were playing the Pacers. Something happened on the court. After the game, it is alleged that one of the players looked down on their chest and saw a laser beam on their chest and somebody said, somebody's pointing a gun at you. And it was alleged that it, the, 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 the laser beam came out of the car that Ja Morant was in. Now, we don't know if Ja had the gun or not. We don't know if it was a gun or not, but we do know that it was a laser beam on somebody's chest and it traumatized that NBA player. And Ja was connected to it. Ja was on social media flashing a gun. Now, there's nothing wrong with having a gun. We legalize guns. Here in the state of Indiana, you don't even need a permit. Just go get a gun and start carrying it. You ain't got to show no ID. You ain't got to show nothing. 
You can be the son of Jack the Ripper and have all of his genes in him. You can be the son of Jeffrey Dahmer. You can be the son of the, the, any mass murderer and have all of their genes and be just like them and have the same proclivity. You can walk into a gun store and buy a gun. I believe you can buy one if you're an ex-con, can you? No. You can't? No. I'm surprised. <laughs> Not yet. Not yet. They're going to pass a law soon that if you're a felon, you can still get a gun. But you can have a gun. You know, I mean, you, you've got politicians who posed on campaign posters. The entire family got guns and they got elected to the United States Congress. But if John Morant flashes a gun on social media, not everybody is just thrown out of whack. But the NBA has intervened and said, yeah, guns are legal. You can't have guns. But we're saying we are holding our players at a higher standard. We don't need you flashing and branding guns on social media. That's doing something to our brand. You're hurting our brand, Ja. And so Ja is not playing basketball. He's on leave somewhere, probably getting some help, getting some counseling and all of that. Somebody needs to get in that brother's face. I'm not saying that they haven't. But what I'm saying is it would be justified if somebody from a different generation would get in that young boy's face, grab him in his collar and say, here is the way things need to work. Now, if you want to remain associated with me, I don't care how much money you make. If you want to remain associated with me as a family member, you need to change your ways. I will pray for you from a distance, but I don't want you around me because that element you bring with you is going to get me and mine hurt as well. So until you get it together, I'm going to be praying for you, but keep that foolishness and your money away from me. Somebody needs to get in these people's face, these young generation. But then when you do it, that drives them even further away. So what do you do? And that's why they're dying so early. The promise is out of the tradition of your foreparents so that you may live long in the land that the Lord your God has given you. You're not living long. You're living shorter lives because of your disregard of the traditions of your fathers. Now, when we talk about individual stuff, individualism, and talk about this text is referring to just your, your uh, nuclear family, your nuclear household, mommy and daddy, and I know that's stuck in our psyche. And even after this conversation that we're having today, it's gonna go right back when you read Genesis 20 and 12, you're gonna say, this is referring to my house, to me honor your father and your mother. And I'm arguing that um, your father and your mother, if you're going to um, apply this personally, then the, then the responsibility is more on you as a parent than on your children. Implied in this commandment is parents carrying themselves as worthy of honor. If you want your children to honor you, you have to carry yourself in a way that they will honor you. This is a challenge to parents more so than it is to children. Now, um, when Moses came out of the wilderness, Moses could have um, set this thing up the way he wanted to set it up. He could have organized this community the way he wanted to organize it. He could have organized this community in a domination model. Moses could have made himself king and had everybody else come and, I mean, this is Moses 
who stood in front of Pharaoh and said, let my people go. And God used him. God parted the Red Sea and allowed this brother to walk through on dry land. And he brought all of these people out. After having brought them out, Moses could have easily said, I'm your new king. And set up that community hierarchically. And y'all know how I feel about hierarchy. I believe that they're demonic. Hierarchically, with Moses at the top, then you got Aaron, and then you have the, the, uh, the tribes of the priests. You have the Korathites, you have the Mararites, and you have the uh, Gresonites. Those are the priests. So Moses could have put himself at the top, and then everybody else under him. But that would have been, in my opinion, it would have been demonic because they are just coming out of Egypt that is set up on the same kind of model. Pharaoh at the top and everybody else is below, is below, which is hierarchical. Now, if that model didn't work for the Israelites in Egypt, it's not gonna work for the Israelites in freedom because it's not so much the individuals it's the structure that you plug individuals in. And if you plug them into a hierarchical system, the same thing that happened to them in Egypt is going to happen again in the wilderness. Because when you've got somebody at the top, you're going to have somebody at the bottom. Period. That's the way hierarchies are designed to function. Somebody is going to be at the bottom. So if I take Pharaoh's model and apply that model, to the Israelites in the wilderness, I'm going to create another underclass. So the people who just came out of slavery in Egypt, some of them are going to end up again at the bottom and be enslaved again because I'm using Pharaoh's model to organize my society. And that's domination. So when they came out of the wilderness, Moses said, I'm going to set this up in an egalitarian model. That is where everybody is equal. So Moses, when you look at the book of Numbers chapter 2, here is how he set it up. It's not hierarchical. It is concentric rectangular. Look at the heart of the community. Is the tabernacle. That is the community's representation of God in the tabernacle. God is at the center, not at the top, not at the bottom. God is at the center. Moses is not at the top. Moses is located, his tribe, on the first uh, 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 the first square that's out, the first rectangle that's outside the tabernacle is where Moses and Aaron are located. You see Moses and Aaron, you see the Merodites, you see the aggressive, the, the aggressionites, and you see the Korathites. These are the priests. They are on the second uh, square outside of the tabernacle. And then on the broader side, you see on the north, the south, the east, and the west, you see three of the 12 tribes of Israel. So you don't see this hierarchically. You see it concentric rectangularly. And that speaks about how this community was run. God is at the center and everything revolves around God. Now that, that's powerful right there. That's how Moses set it up. Moses said, no, I'm not going to be at the top of their mouth beneath me. No, we're going to do it rectangularly, concentric rectangular. God is at the center. And everything else revolves around God. Those who have the most responsibility are closer to the presence of God. And those who have the least responsibility are further away from the tabernacle of God. Because the people who have the most responsibility needs to be closer to God anyway because they're carrying the load for the entire community and if there's anybody that needs power from God it's the leaders but the leaders are not over anybody they revolve around the presence of God 
Now that's a major model. Now, flowing out of that model is how family is set up with God at the center and everything else revolves around God. When you have this type of model that Moses just showed us as the model for your church and community, flowing out of that model, it will influence not only your community, but your household. You will go home and say, here is how God's stuff is set up, and I want to model my stuff after God. So here is how mine is set up. You don't see God is at the center. Now go back. Yeah, God is at the center. God is surrounding everything else in your house revolves around God. That's why when it's like that and you're a leader, you can't say God first, family second, work third up. There is no first, second, or third because there is no hierarchy. Everything revolves around God. Everything is equal. You know, so, and I hear, and, and, I, and I'm guilty of it, you know, I'm guilty of it, I know I am, that my ministry is first, my service to God, and then family, and then other stuff, because I had set this thing up hierarchically, which is, in my opinion, demonic. And it crushes people. It ruins families. It messes up churches. But when God is at the center, there is no first, second, or third. Everything revolves around God. But when you have a church set up hierarchically, you got God at the top. You got the pastor, then you got everybody else beneath the pastor. That's domination. You're putting God at the top. And God is, um, he's, God is at the top. And nothing revolves around God. Everything comes under God. Which means there are some who are further away from the power of God who needs to be closer to the power of God. So this is saying I'm the pastor, so that means I'm closer to God than the rest of y'all. Which couldn't be further from the truth. We are equally close to God. If God is at the center and we are revolving around God, we're all equally close to God. You know, when it comes to church life and church administration and moving a ministry forward, a pastor needs to have the comfort of God in that pastoral context because the pastor does carry a lot of the weight with regard to the church. But in terms of the pastor being closer to God than anybody else in this room, that's not the case. You have as much access to God as anybody else. So when I look at my church from this model, guess how I understand the family? From a hierarchical perspective. Father at the top, mother beneath, children beneath that. And we have spiritualized this. We have sacralize this. We have made this. I mean, even the Apostle Paul has legitified domination in his epistles. And we're going to look at Paul later on. He spiritualizes domination in his epistles. But we have to work with Paul. We have to understand Paul. And I'm not going to get into Paul today. We're going to get into that at some point. How we have spiritualized this hierarchical model for family. Daddy at the top. And daddy dominates everybody else beneath daddy. And then mama is under daddy. 
She dominates the children. Jesus had a serious problem with domination in any form. We're going to look at this and we're going to be done. Jesus had a serious problem with domination wherever the master found domination. I mean, he got a problem with it. Especially when domination came in the household. Because that's how we perpetuate this whole idea of domination. We see it first in the household. That's where it starts. At home. And so here's what Jesus said. Now, Jesus had, had a problem not so much with fatherhood, but he had a problem with how fatherhood was practiced in his day and time as it reflected systems of domination. Now, you can't be out fighting against systems that dominate you and then go home and practice that same system in your household. You're fighting against domination. You're fighting against oppression. And then you go home and dominate and oppress the people in your household. What sense does that make? So Jesus was revolutionary in that he challenged domination wherever he saw it. Here's what the master says. Call no one father on earth, for you have one father in heaven. And the reason the master is saying that, not that he has anything against fatherhood, but he has something against how fatherhood was practiced in ancient Israel during his time, how fathers dominated people beneath him. Jesus said to his disciples, call no man father. Because when you call somebody father within this modality of thinking, you automatically subject yourself to that father's authority in terms of domination. So if I don't call you father, you, you know, what Jesus, when we start understanding Jesus, I mean, I don't know that many of us are really ready for Jesus. I mean, we... We have this interpretation of Jesus that, that is really not a true depiction of who Jesus is. Jesus has some revolutionary thoughts that I think will make most of us in this room uncomfortable. And will probably resist it in the same way he was resisted by his own people in ancient Israel. Call no one father on earth, for you have one father in heaven. He's talking to grown folks. Call no one father. That is, when you call someone father, you automatically, in your mind, subject yourself to the authority of that father. And what Jesus is arguing is that whenever you see domination in whatever form, it's to be resisted. Jesus was an egalitarian at heart. That is, Jesus was one who wanted equality for everybody. Nobody over anybody and nobody under anybody. In fact, when Jesus was about to go to Calvary, he's up in the upper room with his boys and they are arguing over which of them is going to be the greatest. Y'all remember that argument? No, I'm going to be the greatest. No, I'm going to be the greatest. Jesus said, wait a minute. The greatest among you is to be the servant of all. You're talking about hierarchicalism, and I'm talking about how to serve people equally. To the point where the master took off his coat, wrapped a towel around him, got on his knees, and started washing the dirt and the crud between the toes of his disciples. Putting himself what he's actually doing is embarrassing them. You're talking about this under over thing. I'm Jesus. I'm going to go lower on your hierarchy and I'm going to wash your feet. Peter said, Lord, my feet are so nasty and correct. Don't, 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 don't do that. His feet were probably like mine, bunions and everything. Lord, please don't. Jesus said, no, if I, don't, if I don't do it, you can't have any part with me. 
Peter said, if that be the case, just go ahead and give me a bath then. If, if that's you, go ahead and bathe me if that's the case. Jesus said in Mark 3, 33, no, I got that wrong. That's not 33. I don't think there's even 33 chapters in Mark. That might be 333. Um, Jesus in the house teaching and you know, he's, Jesus is doing this thing and somebody comes in and says, hey, Jesus, uh, your, your mother and your sisters and, and, uh, and your brothers are outside, they want you to come out. Jesus said, who are my mother and my brothers? You know, he says, whoever does the will of my father is my mother, my brother, and my sisters. Now, and I want y'all to go read it for yourself. He left out fathers. First of all, he redefines family based upon the spirit rather than bloodlines. Now, a whole lot of us are gonna have a problem with Jesus with that because I love family, you love family. But the man redefines family. He said, who is my mother? Who is my brothers? Who are my brothers? Redefines it. That family is not based upon bloodlines. But family is based upon our being brothers and sisters with a common father in heaven, and that's God. And in this, he said, who are my mother? and my brothers the ones who do the will of my father is my mother my brother and my sisters but he leaves our fathers on purpose why because fathers represent the toxic hierarchical structure that's destroying community he doesn't have a dislike for fathers, but he has a dislike for how fatherhood was practiced as it perpetuated systems of domination in the home. Jesus said in Mark 10, you know, he, he uh, I think this is the text where he just finishes dealing with the, uh, the rich young ruler. The rich young ruler comes in and says, uh, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said, keep the law. He said, I kept the law. Jesus said, you're lacking one thing, shall all you have. Give to the poor and follow me. You'll have riches in heaven. The young man walks away sorrowful because he was very rich. And um, Jesus turns his disciples and say to them, it's going to be hard for a rich person to enter into the kingdom of, of God. It, it will be easier for a, a camel to go through the eye of a needle than it would be for a, as a matter of fact, you know, the, a camel going through the eye of a needle we have to we have to re-understand that because that word translate candle also translate as rope ro a big rope so he is saying it is easier for a big rope to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of god now the disciples said well we left everything for you what do we get out of it i mean we we left it all Jesus said, Mark 10, whoever leaves his mother or father or children or field, and then he goes on and on and on, will not fail to receive brothers, sisters, mother, or children with persecution. He didn't mention fathers. He mentioned leaving fathers for his sake in the gospel, but he didn't mention receiving fathers for his sake in the gospel. Because here, and I need to go back and re-preach this because I've preached it at stewardship and um, I, got, I got another interpretation because it says when you give up all of this for Christ, Christ is going to give you, this is the implication of how we normally preach it, Christ is going to give you brothers, sisters, mothers, children, fields, land, with persecution. So we preach it like when you give to God and forsake others for God, for the gospel, God is going to give you brothers and sisters 
and mothers and children and land and houses 10 times over. That's in the text, 10 times over. And we start giving thinking, God is gonna give me, my brother did me wrong, God is gonna send another brother in my life, God is gonna send me other sisters in my life, God is gonna send other mothers and children, and then God is gonna give me some more land, he's gonna give me a bigger house because I gave all of this up. If that's how you wanna interpret it, that's fine. But here is what I get out of it. Jesus is not so much talking about him giving people anything because the text didn't say he would give it to him. Look at the text. Will not fail to receive. It didn't say Jesus would give them anything. But it says whoever leaves his mother and his father and his children or field or land or houses will, will not fail to receive. What is Jesus talking about? Jesus is not so much making a promise to anybody as the master is describing an egalitarian society. He is saying that when you leave the community that you once lived in and become a part of an egalitarian community, which is the kingdom of God, he says that there will be equal sharing among us with everything. So that, and the text says, he will receive that 100 times. So if I left my mother to connect with the kingdom of God like Jesus was trying to get this rich young ruler to do, if I leave my mother and connect with this community, if there are 100 mothers in that community, all of those women in that community will be considered my mother. So I got a hundred mothers. If there are a hundred brothers in that community, all of them will be my brothers because family is no longer determined by blood ties, but it's determined by our one common bond in Christ, living as God, as our father. He said, you will receive 100 times more houses. If I walk away from my house and connect with this Jesus, Jesus community, if there are 100 houses that are a part of this community, then I will be welcome in each one of those houses as if they belong to me. So I got 100 houses. If, they, if everybody owns a field and we connect as a community, it's not just one field that I have, now I got 100 fields. Because every field that my brother has and my sister have, also belong to me. But one of the things that's missing, he said, whoever leaves mother or father or children or field will not fail to receive brothers, sisters, mothers, children, but he didn't mention father. Because if a father is connected to this type of egalitarian community, he's going to bring with him his own uh, uh, a sense of entitlement. I'm the father, that means I get to be at the top. No, you're going to come in and you're going to destroy the egalitarian society and you're going to implement a society that's built on domination and hierarchy because you're going to want to claim your position at the top. So Jesus does the same thing about fathers. So, honor your father and your mother so that your days on this land that God has given you may be long or honor the tradition of your foreparents so that you may live long in the land that your God is giving you. Any questions? We're going to stop right there. Yes. But uh, 